Hi there, this is the 50th video in our channel. So it's special for me in its own way. Let's discuss something different today. How about discussing preventive urogynecology? Trust me, this subject has a potential to become a subspeciality of urogynecology in future someday. So if you don't know what preventive urogynecology is, the answer is very simple. Good obstetrics is preventive urogynecology. Let's understand what is this pelvic floor and what are its disorders. This is a beautiful animation created by Continence Foundation of Australia. So you can see that the pelvic organs are resting on a diaphragm which is made up of muscles. And this muscle diaphragm has the major three openings. I want you to appreciate the synchronous action of the muscle fibers. Now what may cause loss of this beautifully synchronous action of pelvic floor musculature? Maybe just a tear of few muscle fibers or evulsion of entire muscle from its insertion injury to the nerve that supplies this muscle and brings about this coordinated action or even just a muscle overstretching. But the bigger question is what causes all this trauma? Despite this age-old understanding of the pelvic floor disorder and childbirth trauma as its cause, many a times we find ourselves in surprising circumstances. Women who had no vaginal birth come with SUI, or at times para-10 living 10 presents with a beautiful pelvic floor with no defects. Now how do you explain this? In 2016, a very interesting model of lifespan analysis of pelvic floor disorder was published. It says that there are three phases in a woman's life. Phase 1 From birth to 20 years, where good nutrition and muscle activity is important for growth and development. Phase 2 is her reproductive years, where insults to pelvic floor may occur. In phase 3 of life, when menopause sets in, in women who have lower grafts in their phase 1 and 2 will have more probability of touching the symptom threshold line faster. As the gynecologist, we can hardly do anything for phase 1 and 3, while phase 2, mind it, it's totally in our control. Now this is a very motivating statement and brings a lot of responsibility on the person who conducts the first delivery. The good news is that if we are vigilant, if we are careful, we can really make a difference in a lady's life and her future in these few hours. Unfortunately, as you can see, there is no consensus globally about the do's and don'ts during labor. The only way is to review the individual research papers and brew them with our experience and common sense. In this respect, I will discuss seven important practices that can be a real game changer for the patient and for you too.
Let's start from perineal massage. In my days of residency, massaging the perineum of the laboring lady was more or less like a norm. Perineal massage had a significant impact on the reduction of need of episiotomies and the duration of second stage of labor. Even antenatal perineal massage has been found to be very effective in reducing perineal trauma. Giving episiotomy is not wrong. What is important is the correct technique, correct time and correct angle. Regent's Maneuver. It was reviewed in the year 2020. And what did they conclude from this? That Regent's Maneuver during labor is not productive for severe perineal laceration and is associated with higher postpartum pain. Thus, it was suggested that it should not be used routinely during normal labor. Next in the line is use of warm compressions. Warm compresses applied during the second stage of labor increase the incidence of delivery with intact perineum. Perineal support. As this subject lacks adequate evidence, I suggest we use our own experience, teachings and common sense till we get consolidated proof of using or not using perineal support during delivery. Now this is something interesting, the Cochrane Review. They included all the practices from A to E which I have told you in there were 20 trials and 15,000 women. And as always, they concluded that in any of these topics, actually there is not enough evidence to change the practices. So you see, we have so many topics of research, of thesis and of papers in these topics in preventive urogynecology. Early versus delayed pushing, not enough evidence. What about the fundal pressure? Cochrane says they don't have enough evidence. However, all recent studies are against it. My personal opinion is that it's a beautiful moment for the patient and let's make it as beautiful as possible for her. Simultaneously preventing the pelvic floor trauma. So tell me, who is a preventive urogynecologist? Yes, you all are, mind it. <laughs>